Tom, when we talk about Bible and science, very often people immediately leap to the book to of Genesis, Genesis and the creation accounts. But yes. you take us to the book of Job. Yeah. Why is that? Why is that? Well, well, one of the reasons is that um, I want people to look at all the creation stories in the Bible. I tried. I lost count the other day. I got up to 35 or so. Um, Genesis 1 and 2 are just uh, are ones, but they're, they're the rather formal, developed ones. There's nothing wrong with them, but they're quite... They're, um, they're quite, they're, yeah, they're, very, they're not creation 101, right? Um, and for me, the book of Job has always, as a scientist, has always been the most extraordinary and beautiful and profound expression of wisdom to do with nature. Um, so, for example, when in the book of Job, God finally, Yahweh finally answers Job's complaints after 37 chapters of beating at his door, what comes to our great surprise is not immediately something that looks like an answer to Job's complaint, but a poem of questions about the natural world. Do you know where light comes from? Where the hail derives from? Can you explain why the Pleiades are bound tightly as stars, whereas the stars of Orion are dispersed? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you explain why the uh, hawk can navigate to the south? Um, these are, it goes on for 135 questions. Um, now, the reason that not just myself, but other scientists I've shown this beautiful text to are unfamiliar with it, are deeply impressed, is because we know that unlike everything we teach our school science pupils or even at university, that actually, you know, you'll get full marks if you get the right answers. To do science isn't so much about getting the right answers. It's about conceiving the insightful and creative question. Yes. So this questioning is deeply impressive and I wanted to start from there. Where does this lead us? I think you have a habit, don't you, of, of putting this text or at least suggesting it to, to scientists. What's typically their reaction? Well, their reaction is um, amazement. I'm not talking about just scientists who go to church or believers by any, by any means. Yeah. I mean, it's a wonderful ancient poem about nature which one can look at with secular eyes um, and, and rejoice in it. And I say, because, because uh, all scientists know that the creative question is the key to cracking open the problem, um, they'll resonate with this. And it also somehow, rather anachronistically, but it nonetheless sets an agenda for we, the sciences we now call meteorology, astronomy, geology, zoology, they're all there in the Lord's answer to Job. And th then the task I set myself for, for the book writing business, well, why is that an answer to Job? Because most of the critics of the book of Job, a lot of the critical literature says it's not an answer to Job's question at all. It's a nothing, it's a petulant put down <laughs> by a God who wants Job to shut up and feel ignorant. I've never been happy with that interpretation. Now, quite a lot of these ancient texts are looking at the kind of tension between chaos and order, yeah. aren't they? And that's a sort of a resonance there with science. Yeah. Um, in fact, I looked back at my own scientific career the other day, just sort of all what, what what is it that makes me curious? What do I like working on? And I realised that for me, the tension between order and chaos, or maybe even the emergence of order from chaos, is a big theme of all the science I've done. I'm fascinated by that because you wouldn't anticipate that order could come from a big mess. You know, if you, you know, looked at my office, you certainly wouldn't <laughs> think that any order would come from that mess. Um, so take one example. Um, if, uh, if we look inside the cells of animals and plants, um, right down at the molecular level, all these molecules that have to signal to each other and function, um, to make your muscles work or to, um, uh, to manuf uh, manufacture adrenaline, all those sorts of things. Um, there's beautiful biochemistry going on there, but the environment is a, what scientists call a noisy one. Um, heat is at the molecular world, just a random motion of everything. Um, molecules can drift off in one direction or the other, there doesn't seem any rhyme or reason to it, and yet, and yet, within this noisy environment and even out of it comes order. And I'm fascinated by the, the thought experiment that you, you might think, well, it surely wouldn't, wouldn't we work better if we could turn that all noise all off? Well, we could. We could and, but that would mean freezing everything. But you know what happens to living things when you freeze them? They die. So there's something about life that requires this noisy, chaotic, underpinning, seething world of randomness um, for structure to emerge. And that, I'm fascinated by working out why that is and how that is. 
What sort of wisdom can, for instance, the Bible provide for a modern scientific age? Well, I, I think the Bible, the inheritance of, of biblical wisdom, can help us rediscover in the long story what science is for. Um, so, for example, the difficult social questions that we, we, we never seem to have, be able to have adult conversations over, you know, um, what do we do about climate change? Um, uh, what about uh, genetic medicine, mitochondrial DNA? Um, nanotechnology. Um, people just argue about these questions. We don't seem to be able to handle a, a scientific debate about how we should change the world. How do we negotiate the, the, um, the battle between people who'd want to leave a forest completely alone and others who'd want to manage it? Is it natural? Is it something that we can use the wood for? You know, those sorts of questions. We just get stuck. And actually, I think that the a biblical concept of, of wisdom uh, thought carefully through within the role of what we as human beings do under God to, to steward the creative world can, can really help even a secular political debate get that, get that right. Because I think there are missing, what I call missing narratives, um, that if we had them there would lubricate and ease the rather vicious um, oppositional debates we have about those questions.